Hey guys, Al Bigley here once again. Well, this time we look at another aspect of Marvel Comics, particularly what made them so unique when they re-debuted in the 60s with their superhero line that we now know so well. So let's take a close look at some of the covers. The very first thing that readers would see picking up comics on the comic book rack and what made them different, how Marvel used them to really sell their new line, how Marvel really used those covers to grab readers in a way DC Comics just wasn't doing. So it's now the early 60s and DC Comics, who have been the leader in superhero comics since 1938 or so with their debut of Superman, are the industry leaders. And they felt like they could just do no wrong and they would be on top forever. And who can blame them for having that attitude? For years, they've gone along with the big guns, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. Even after World War II and the superhero slump, they still published those big three characters. Then came, of course, their late 50s revival with new versions of older characters, Green Lantern, The Flash, Hawkman, etc. DC felt they could do no wrong, and who could blame them? They had those big characters, those big, well-known characters who also benefited from the exposure they got from movie serials, which Batman and Superman had, radio shows and TV shows, again, Superman, and all that other outside exposure. And you gotta remember DC at the time, most of their covers depended on the recognizable factor of Superman, Batman, and the others. And most of their covers would try to grab readers through some sort of puzzle. Like, why is Superman fighting his double? Why has Batman been turned into a baby? Why does the Flash now have a huge head? Why do we now have talking gorillas everywhere? That was DC's main way of grabbing readers. Well, here comes Marvel Comics all of a sudden in the early 60s with the Fantastic Four and a few other characters. All wonderfully created by Stan Lee and a host of great artists like Jack Kirby. Marvel, because of reasons we won't get into here, had to kind of limit their distribution thanks to a deal made through DC Comics as their distributor for a while. So that meant less space on the comic book racks. So they had to really work twice as hard with the limited amount of books they had to really grab new readers' attention and maybe wrestle away some readers from DC Comics. Of course, one of the biggest positive points of Marvel's covers was the utilization of great artists like Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, and John Romita Sr. So let's look at some of the ways Marvel used their covers a little more creatively than DC. Here's an early issue of Tales to Astonish featuring Giant Man. It would soon feature the Hulk and the Submariner and all those characters. You'll notice Marvel, like DC, would use word balloons, but they'd really thicken them up. They'd really outline those word balloons in a way DC didn't somehow that made the comic covers more graphic, more grabbing, more like billboards. Notice how these covers had a wonderful posterized effect, very graphic and striking. And unlike DC's many cop-out covers, most of these scenes truly reflected what was happening inside the comic. And speaking of billboards, Marvel wasn't afraid to even point to what's happening on their covers, almost yelling to you in this issue, this happens. The Hulk faces this villain. It was like screaming, just like any advertisement would. You can't miss this issue. This is important. They weren't afraid to be this graphic. They weren't afraid to use this kind of really bold graphic advertising, basically, to grab your attention. And this kind of joining of text and graphics really probably encouraged a lot of young people to really want to learn how to read to find out what was going on on these exciting covers. Again, here's another example, pointing to the action. This character is actually revealing one of the superhero's secret identities, something that just wasn't done then. Certainly not at DC, where it would have been a dream or some kind of cop-out, some kind of symbolic cover. This just screams at you, look what happens. How can we do this? How can you afford not to read this? Just incredible. Of course, we're talking about a period where comic books were sold on spinner racks like this in convenience stores, department stores, drug stores, 
even liquor stores. They were everywhere. And both DC and Marvel knew the most important part of the comic would be the part that gets seen right from the far side of the store, which means the upper third of the cover. So it was important that you really grabbed readers also just using this space. One way Marvel did that was unique corner boxes. In this case, again, Tales to Astonish features the Hulk and the Submariner. You'll notice a distinct corner box. And again, you can see that corner box even before pulling out the issue as a consumer to look at it as it's displayed in the rack. Let's look at some other unique Marvel Comics corner boxes. The corner boxes also serve as an introduction to these characters for lots of new readers, especially when trying to decipher what was going on on some of Marvel's more crowded covers. Of course, something you're noticing on a lot of these covers too is the hucksterism, the, again, blatant advertising that's happening right on the covers themselves to sell these items. That, of course, goes to the credit of Stan Lee, who developed that kind of banter, who developed that kind of style. Even some talking directly to the reader, like, we're in the same club as you are. We love these like you. As opposed to DC, which was more like, here's another Superman adventure. If you like Superman, you're by it. If not, we don't really care. It made Marvel readers feel like the creators of this stuff were also fans. In continuing that idea of these covers being used almost as blatant, crass advertising, Marvel wasn't afraid even to kind of cross-promote their books and their product. Again, early Tales to Astonish cover from 1966. Your notice on this billboard in the background is right on the cover, an advertisement for the then-current Marvel Superheroes limited animation syndicated TV cartoons. Sure, it's obvious and blatant, but there it is, worked right into the artwork. And what do we see here right on the cover? An advertisement for Marvel's then popular fan club, the Merry Marvel Marching Society. Take a look here too at some of the shading Marvel used. Some of their covers would seem a little heavier than DC's more cartoony covers. You'd see a lot more deeper blues, grays. They made it seem like they were working with far more than the same primary colors DC seemed to be working with. Let's also take a look at the distinctive logos. Instead of just reading Action Comics or Batman, like at DC, we got the Amazing Spider-Man, the Incredible Hulk. All these wonderful adjectives, again, seen above that top third of the comic, so it can be seen clearly across a crowded store to draw readers in and get them to come running. Here comes the Spider-Man. Marvel was even so bold as to kind of co-op the then current pop art movement, adopting this short lived corner box. Hey, if you're not buying them for the adventures, buy them because they're art. Marvel wasn't afraid to try to attract any possible new audience. Notice how a lot of these blurbs also are about what happens to the character and not the puzzle of the issue like a DC Comics. They're not so much about why is Spider-Man doing this, but more about what will happen to this character you've grown to love if this depicted image really occurs. Again, it seemed less like gimmicks and more about the status quo and the characters and what could happen to disrupt that status quo. Now, as much hype as Stan Lee would put on these covers, he also knew when to give readers a break. Here are some covers that feature no text or no word balloons, which was a real rarity then when you were trying hard to sell these again by the covers alone. And yes, some of these do use some lettering, announcing the titles of the stories inside. But notice how they're free from the so-called comic booky word balloons. That in itself making a sort of powerful artistic statement. At a time when DC Comics was assuming that all their readers were five, six, seven, or eight, and didn't really care about first issues or milestone issues, Marvel was not afraid even then to let you know this was a number one issue, a collector's item, or a big premiere issue. 
boldly stating it right on the cover. And that was another way they appealed to their older readers, who may have already been collecting for quite some time. In addition to newer readers excited to get in early on a new comic title. Talk about really using a cover as a billboard. Look at this image of Daredevil number one. The artwork is almost completely jammed off the cover for all the text and blurbs hyping it. It all almost comes off like carnival attraction posters, trying hard to get your attention. Again, here's another cover telling you everything it's in this issue. Just in case you're not even inclined to open it up, we're going to tell you right on the cover. How can you miss all that we're offering? And lest you think this happened a few years into the Marvel Age, as early as Fantastic Four number three, Stan Lee was already using that top third cover space to declare the comic book, quote, the world's greatest comic magazine. And with Stan and his artist Jack Kirby at their creative peaks back then, that wasn't boasting. And once again, such oversized grand statements really could hook a potential new reader who might think he's really missing out on something. So anyway, those are just a few ways that Marvel used their biggest asset, the visibility of their covers across newsstands and stores all over the world to sell those comics. And really it was part of, if not a major part of, the reason for their big success at the time. Hope this may have thrown a spotlight on some things you didn't know or always wondered about. Give this video a like if you liked it. And subscribe and also ask me any questions down there below in the wonderful comments section if I can cover anything in the future. And next time maybe we'll cover Marvel's visual appeal in the 70s. Things did change a bit during that decade. That's when I came in as a young reader. Thank you for joining me. Thank you again for your interest. And I'll see you soon.